Okay guys, we're back. I've got a fresh battery and we're ready to talk cell notation. What we've been doing so far is a full pictorial representation of a voltaic cell. But that takes up a lot of space and we want to be able to do something that's a bit more shorthand. Now remember when we go shorthand, we leave out some of the details, but we got enough information to recreate okay so cell notation sometimes called line notation is a shorthand way to represent the structure of a voltaic cell or an electrolytic cell and it follows the following pattern and we scoot this up a little bit ah too far okay it's going to be we're going to list what the anode is made out of, and then a vertical line, then the components of the anode compartment, a double line, components of the cathode compartment, single vertical line, cathode. A single vertical line tells us we're seeing a change in phase. The double line represents the external circuit and the salt bridge. So we're going to do a cell notation for two voltaic cells we've already represented above. So let's look at one of our cells up here above. We'll start out with this slip on up here. Let's start with this guy. Okay? Now, zinc is what the cathode is made out of. So I'm going to put zinc solid a line and then I've got zinc 2 plus ions aqueous double line copper 2 plus aqueous single line copper solid so the cell notation for this cell would look like this okay zinc vertical line zinc 2 plus aqueous double line copper 2 plus aqueous single line copper solid all right now let's look at the other cell that we were looking at okay if we look at this one Starting with our anode, our anode is carbon graphite. Okay, so I write carbon graphite and I put a line in. And then I'm going to put iodide ions, aqueous, and then a line and then iodine solid. The line says phase transition. Double line. And then I'm going to have MnO4, 1 minus aqueous, <coughs> plus H plus aqueous, <coughs> plus Mn2 plus aqueous, <coughs> up and down line, carbon graphite. <coughs> the cell notation here is going to look like this. <coughs> so all the information, well, the basic information about the voltaic cell is there. We have to guess at what ions to use in the salt bridge. Uh, we have to work from there to be able to write the half reactions, but this is cell notation.
based on the differences in the ability of the elements to attract and hold on to electrons. The next thing we need to be able to do is to be able to relate electrical chemical potential that the redox reaction has, which is called voltage, and we're going to be able to relate that electrical chemical potential to energy. Okay, so electrical potential, also called voltage, sometimes called the cell potential or the cell voltage, is a measure is measured in units of volts, <clears throat> and it tells us something about the potential to transfer electrons, how much it wants to transfer electrons. We talk, we're going to talk about E cell and E zero cell. E zero cell is under standard state conditions. E cell is not under standard state conditions. For a spontaneous process, E cell is going to be positive. So a common alkali flashlight battery is a 1.5 volt potential. A lead car battery is made up of six individual cells that are two volts apiece. A calculator battery is 1.3. A lithium ion laptop battery is 3.7. An electric eel has about 5,000 cells that have a potential of 0.15 apiece. And the nerve of a giant squid is 0 0.07 volts. To determine E0 cell um, would be for a specific oxidation reduction half reaction combo, we're going to use what are called standard half cells. <clears throat> so E0 cell is going to be E0 anode half cell plus E0 cathode half cell. And half cell potentials are measured against <clears throat> a common reference cell. Okay, now what do I mean by common reference cell? It's kind of like if you're driving down the highway and you, well, the interstate, and you cross from one state to another. At the border between the states, if you're going west to east, you hit and they start numbering at zero again and numbering up as you go east. So you could say, I'm on 2059 and I'm at mile marker 50 in Alabama from the Mississippi-Alabama state line. Or you could say I'm 20 miles in the Mississippi from the Alabama state line. And that tells you something about where you are. Okay? So let's look at this table of half cells. So I'm going to pull up the table <clears throat> and we're going to flash it on the screen and we're going to talk about it a little bit. 857. Okay, <clears throat> let me scoot this around. All right, this is a standard half cell potential tape. Now, one of the things I want you to notice about these half cells is that they're all written as reductions. Okay, so these are all reduction half cell potentials. So if you notice up here at the top, okay, look at the first one here, fluorine plus two electrons going to the fluoride ions. It has a cell potential of 2.87, which means that that in conjunction with the reference half cell wants to happen. That makes this half reaction the strongest reduction half reaction on the table. So that makes fluorine a very strong oxidizing agent. Okay, it's the strongest oxidizing agent here. Now as we go down the table, 
Okay, notice the values get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, our reference half cell is the hydrogen half cell. Let's see. Okay, this one right here. Notice its potential is set as zero. It's our reference point. It's kind of like the state border. Down below that, okay, we have reduction half cell values that are negative, which means relative to the hydrogen half cell, these reactions really want to run in reverse. So lithium would much rather go to the lithium ion and an electron than the lithium ion picking up an electron to go to lithium. So oxidation half reactions are going to be at the bottom of this table running in the reverse direction. Reduction half reactions, we're going to want to take from the top of this table, running in the direction written. Okay? Okay, I'll scoot this back up this way. When I'm doing a mix and match to build a voltaic cell, I want to pull a redox half reaction higher up on this table and combine it with a oxidation half reaction on the bottom of the table. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the standard for comparisons to have hydrogen half cell is set to be zero. Notice all half cells are written as reduction half cells. So they're written as if they're happening at the cathode. Those half reactions with positive values are good cathode half reactions. Those with negative values actually want to run in reverse and be anode half reactions. So when we mix and match to create a voltaic cell, you want to choose a half reaction higher up on the table for the cathode and a half reaction further down on the table to run in reverse for the anode half reaction. Okay? Note. E anode half cell is the negative of the E zero anode half cell. The negative is there because you're reversing the reaction. Okay? So, when I look at this, I can say E zero cell is E zero cathode plus E zero anode half cell, or E of the E cathode plus E anode, or E zero cathode plus a negative E0 anode or E cathode minus E anode. Okay, so E0 cell equals E0 cathode minus E0 anode. So we're going to look at problem 19.4 and 19.5 on page 5, 858 and 860. So let's go to 858. Now, I'm going to write the reactions here. It says tabulate the standard electrical potential for the reaction as follows. Okay, we've got three lead two plus ions, aqueous, reacting with two chromium solids to give us three leads solid and two chromium three plus aqueous. Okay guys, so there's our reaction. Now we're going to split this into half reactions. So I've got three lead two plus going to three lead solid and I've got three leads on both sides. I've got a plus six here, so I'm going to have to add six electrons. Okay, here I've got two chromium solids going to two chromium three pluses, and again I've got two times three, that's plus six, so I've got six electrons. So this top one here, this is my reduction. 
the bottom one here, this is our oxidation. Okay? So let's look at our half reaction table and see if we can't find these half reactions. Okay. Now, the reduction half reaction, we're going to look for it written as is. I'm going to look for lead 2 plus as a reactant. So, there it is. Okay, lead 2 plus as a reactant. So if I look at that, lead 2 plus is a reactant. So the E0 half cell here is a minus 0 0.13 volts. Now, to find our other half reaction, I'm going to be looking for chromium 3 plus on the reactant side and chromium on the as the element on the product side. So let's scroll down here some more. So I'm looking for chromium 3 plus and chromium solid. So there we go. Okay. Now there's my standard E0 half cell. It's for the reduction, but I'm going to use it as is. So the E0 half cell here. is a minus 0 0.73 volts. Okay, now let's come back over here. My reduction, this is my cathode half reaction. My oxidation, this is my anode. So E0 cell is going to be cathode minus 0 0.13 volts minus anode, which is a minus 0 0.73 volts. A negative and a negative is a positive, so get a 0 0.63 volts. I mean, just get six zero. So anode minus cathode. This is taken straight off the table. Okay? And remember that negative sign is there because we reversed the reaction compared to the way it was written on the table. Now, if we look at 19.5 on page 860. Okay, we're given two reactions. Okay. The two reactions we're given are zinc plus nickel 2 plus going to zinc 2 plus plus nickel and zinc plus calcium 2 plus going to zinc 2 plus plus calcium. It says, are these redox reactions spontaneous under standard conditions? Okay, so let's tackle them one at a time. First one is zinc plus nickel 2 plus going to zinc 2 plus plus nickel. Okay, split it into half reactions. I've got zinc solid going to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. Okay, that's our oxidation. That's at the anode. 
And then I'm going to have nickel 2 plus plus 2 electrons going to nickel. This is our reduction. This is at the cathode. Okay, I need to get E0 half cell for each of these. I'm going to look for the nickel 2 plus first. When I look at the nickel 2 plus, okay, I get a minus 0 0.23. Volt half cell potential. Now I'm looking for zinc. And I get a minus 0 0.76 volts. So the E0 cell is going to be a minus 0 0.23 volts minus a minus 0 0.76 volts. So I get a plus 0 0.53 volts. This reaction is spontaneous. If we look at the second reaction in that problem, we're told that we have Instead of nickel, we have calcium, 2 plus. Okay, so the zinc half reaction is the same, but the other half reaction is now calcium, 2 plus, picking up two electrons, going to calcium. This is our reduction, and it's at the cathode. So I'm going to look up E0 half cell. Okay? So when I look at E0 half cell, for the calcium 2 plus, let's see, calcium, calcium, calcium. I get a minus 2.76 volts. So E0 cell is going to equal a minus 2.76 volts minus a 0 0.76 volts, which gives me a minus 2.00 volts. This would be non-spontaneous. Okay, because the E0 cell is negative. <clears throat> okay. Now, The half cell table can also be a useful tool in determining relative strength of oxidizing agents and reducing agents. The strongest oxidizing agents are found at the top of the table on the reactant side, like the fluorine that I was pointing out earlier. The strongest reducing agent is found at the bottom of the table on the product side. Okay, now I'm pretty sure you can read a table. I'm not gonna bore you with that here in the video. All right, we've already, I've already mentioned this once, but earlier we discussed energy, okay? And energy in terms of electrochemical cells. The further you are away from equilibrium, of course, in a chemical reaction, the more energy there is to be released on the way to equilibrium. This holds true in our electrochemical cells based on redox chemistry, just like they would be in any other kind of chemical reaction. So we need to be able to write, relate E0 cell, the equilibrium constant, and um, ultimately delta G0. Turns out that E0 cell is equal to 0 0.0592 volts times the log of K over N, 
where n is the number of electrons being exchanged in the reaction. So that number of electrons in the half reactions before you combine them. Delta G0 is equal to minus NF E0 cell. F is called Faraday's constant, and it's just a number. Now these are some plug and chug equations, okay? <clears throat> and you can look at problem 19.6 and problem 19.7 to learn, you know, to see examples of how to plug and chug in those. What they're bringing us to is the Nernst equation. E cell is equal to E zero cell minus RT NF natural log of Q. T is temperature in Kelvin. R is the gas constant in terms of joules. So it's 8.314 joules per, I think that should be moles Kelvin. N is moles, yeah, that's supposed to be moles. Let me fix that because that's gonna drive me crazy. N is moles and F is Faraday's constant. 9.65 times 10 to the 4 joules over volts times moles of electrons. So we're going to do example 19.8, which is using the Nernst equation. Okay? So let me flip over to the doc cam. And we're going to look at 19.8. Problem 19.8 says determine the cell potential of electrochemical cell based on the following two half reactions. The oxidation half reaction is nickel solid going to nickel 2 plus, concentration 2 molar, plus 2 electrons, and VO2 1 plus at 0 0.010 molar, 2 at 2H two plus 1 molar going to VO2 plus aqueous 2 molar water liquid. Okay, so I've got my oxidation half reaction, I've got my reduction half reaction. The first thing that we want to do in this problem is we want to calculate E0 cell. Okay? And I gotta find a marker that works. E0 cell. Now, that's going to be based on using our standard half cell table. So let me put this in here. Let's flip over to our standard half cell table. And our first half reaction is our, um, let's look at our reduction half reaction. That's VO2 plus, VO2 plus. Ah, there is our first half reaction. There's our cathode half reaction. So it has a cell potential of one volt. Our second half reaction is our anode half reaction, and it involves nickel. So come down here to nickel. And its standard half cell is minus 0 0.23 volts. So our E0 cell here Okay, is 1 minus a minus 0 0.23 volts, so it's 1.23 volts. Okay, so we've got our E0 half cell. Now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to write our overall reaction so that we can get our Q. Okay? Got it. 
All right, now the reaction, the first reaction or oxidation half reaction involves two electrons. The bottom half reaction, the reduction half reaction involved one. So I'm gonna have to double the bottom one. So my final reaction is going to be nickel solid plus BO2 one, uh, plus two of those plus four hydrogen ions going to nickel two plus aqueous plus V2 VO2 pluses. Plus two H2Os. And that's liquid, that's aqueous. So I have nickel solid plus two vanadium, well, VO2 one plus, plus four hydrogen ions going to a nickel two plus plus two VOs, two plus, plus two waters. Okay, if I write my Q expression here, it's going to be then the concentration of nickel two plus times the concentration of VO two plus squared over the concentration of VO two one plus squared times the concentration of hydrogen ion to the fourth. So if we plug in our values for Q, okay, and kind of, there we go. Then our concentration of nickel two plus is given to us as two molar. Our concentration of VO2 plus is 2 molar. The concentration of VO2 1 plus is 0, 0.0 molar. And our concentration of hydrogen ion was given to us as 1 molar. So let's solve for Q. So I have two times two squared, so two squared is four times two is eight, divided by 0 0.01. So I get a Q of 800, okay? So E cell, is going to equal following our equation E0 cell which is 1.23 volts minus R which is 8.314 times the temperature which we were told was 298 Kelvin over the number of electrons and the number of electrons was 2 times Faraday's constant which is 9.65 times 10 to the 4 and that's joules over moles of electrons and that's mol don't worry about the units as long as you're using it correctly it'll be okay and then we've got the natural log of Q which is 800 so 800 natural log times 8.314 times 298 divided by 2 divided by 9.65 exp4 and so I get 1.23 minus 
zero point zero eight six. So I get one point one four volts. So this cell has a potential of one point one four volts. Okay. All right. Now, we're going to let our calculators cool off for a little bit, and we're going to talk about batteries. Okay? You're walking around the room with me while I'm getting stuff switched over. So, batteries. Batteries are self-contained groups of voltaic cells arranged in series. Okay? So a group of electrochemicals, voltaic cells arranged in series. Um, and the sing or it can also refer to a single voltaic cell where we have a slurry of paste ingredients instead of a solution so that we can keep the concentrations high. A dry cell, okay, actually contains a large amount of water. I always think that that's kind of an oxymoron. They call it a dry sweat cell, but it's the wettest type of battery that you can make. Okay, now let's talk about types of batteries. The first type of battery is called a primary battery. A primary battery is a single use battery. It's not rechargeable. Alkaline batteries made with zinc and magnesium manganese oxide are considered to be primary batteries. So the batteries you buy, you know, the, the Duracell batteries, the Energizer batteries, those are primary batteries. A mercury button battery, disposable batteries for watches and hearing aids, they're primary batteries. Lithium batteries for, pre for um, pacemakers, primary batteries. A secondary battery is a rechargeable battery, and the redox reaction is reversible to a reasonable degree. Okay? Example is your car lead battery. Now, does your car lead battery work for forever? The answer is no, okay? The reaction is reversible, reasonably reversible, but sometimes when you run it backwards, side reactions happen. Your car battery is made up of a series of 12 plates. They come in six pairs. The cathode, of the pairs is a, um, a grid of a lead oxide, okay? And it is brittle. Driving on rough roads will actually damage your battery and shorten its life. The anodes, okay, are made of panels of what's referred to as spongy lead. And you have six voltaic cells working in that chamber all together to get you to use the 12 volt battery. Now, nickel hydride batteries, lithium ion batteries are all secondary batteries and they're rechargeable. Okay, but your phone battery will eventually die, the rechargeable battery in your computer will eventually die, your car battery will eventually die. When we talk about being dead, it we really are talking about a battery that won't produce enough current. Not that the chemical potential has gone to zero, it's that you're not producing enough current to drive something. Most batteries, when we consider them dead, still have a substantial voltage, okay? Fuel cells, also called flow cells. In a fuel cell, it's a battery where the components of the reaction are continuously fed in to the anode and cathode chambers and the production, the products of the reactions are removed. 
Fuel cells usually involve the redox reaction of a combustible material. Okay, so you can think about a fuel cell as looking like this. Um, the hydrogen fuel cell is one that was very popular a few years ago. It was the wave of the future. It hasn't manifest. But you put hydrogen in at the anode, oxygen in at the cathode, electrons move through the external circuit, and through the membrane, hydrogen ions move, well, hydronium moves from anode to cathode, and when the hydronium ions make it over to the cathode compartment, they combine hydrogen ions with the oxide ions to make water. Okay. Now, we could go in, there are lots and lots of new and developing fuel cells, um, but we don't have enough time to go into all of them, but it's really cool. You might want to read about it. So let's talk about corrosion. Corrosion is a spontaneous redox reaction that happens in the environment and converts metal, at, uh, metal to metal oxides. Iron corrosion is the most common. 25% of all steel in the U.S. is produced to replace steel that has corroded. Now, how do you stop a spontaneous redox reaction in nature? Okay. How do you stop rust? Well, one thing I want you to think about is when rust happens, you notice that there are pitting spots and spots where it has really hot, heavy layers of the iron free oxide. And the iron itself actually acts as the external circuit and the anode and the cathode. Triple duty. Okay? To have rust or have any corrosion, you got to have water. Water acts as the medium for the reaction to happen in. Okay, one region here of the iron is acting as the cathode, where my little spinny thing is. And that's where iron is going to iron two plus. At another location, those electrons are reacting with oxygen and some hydrogen ions, and they're making water, and we get the reaction we're producing, we are producing rust. So there's our reaction. Iron goes to iron two plus plus two electrons. And then oxygen combines with the oxide. Uh, oxygen combines with hydrogen ions to make water. And then we, that's wrong, that should be iron. Anyway, we get the formation of rust. Note, water and oxygen are needed for rust to happen. Um, and you need really acidic, an acidic environment helps speed things along. To prevent rusting of iron, we can either coat the steel or the iron with something so that it doesn't make contact with air and water, or you can use a sacrifice anode, which is a metal that is more reactive than, in this case, iron, that will be eaten away and react and leave your metal that you want to preserve alone. So zinc is a very common sacrifice anode. If you look at pictures of battleships that are running high in the water, you'll know along the metal hull every so often you'll see these strange blocks and you're going, why are they doing that? Well, there's a blocks of zinc and the zinc along with the paint on the ship, okay, is going to protect it from rusting, okay? Copper is another thing that we commonly use, and copper will rust, called oxidize, and give you a copper oxide. What's really interesting is when the first bit of oxidation happens and you get a copper oxide coat, like on the Statue of Liberty, Liberty, it protects the copper underneath from further oxidation. Same thing happens with aluminum cans. Aluminum cans actually have on the outside of the aluminum and on the inside of the can an aluminum oxide coat. Um, to preserve 
the aluminum cans and protect them from the acidity of soft drinks, they actually also put a little plastic coat on the inside. Okay? Now, this is a good place for me to stop for the day. And the last thing we have to talk about here in this chapter is electrochemistry. Uh, electrolysis of molten salts and an electrolysis from water. So that's our next topic.